Hello and welcome to this quick review looking at enthalpy changes and calorimetry. Um, like it says in the grey box, make sure your independent study tasks and your notes are in front of you because this is obviously designed to be used alongside them. So I'm going to start by quickly running through how to look at enthalpy definitions. I'm not going to go through each one in turn um, because that would take too long and besides that should be within your independent study tasks already. If you haven't done so, it's a good idea when you've finished to go away and make a flashcard for each one of these and to learn them because they will come up in exams. So focusing on the actual specific standard enthalpy changes that you need to know, uh, let's have a think about what they have in common because an enthalpy and an enthalpy change is quite straightforward. So I've left those ones at the top for you to digest yourself. So somewhere in all four definitions we have standard conditions mentioned, standard states mentioned, and one mole mentioned. The only exception that you'll notice is standard enthalpy of reaction, but I'll come to that to deal with that in a second. So standard conditions equate to a temperature of 298 Kelvin and a pressure of 100 kilopascals. Now it's worth pointing out at this stage that one atmosphere, or the standard atmospheric pressure that we have at sea level is 101 kilopascals, so it's very close to this particular amount. So we assume that standard conditions are 298k and 100 kPa. So the standard states represent the physical states each reactant or product exists in under standard conditions as defined in the bottom left of the screen. So, um, we use one mole in our definitions because those particular enthalpy changes, those standard enthalpy changes, are measured as kilojoules per mole to the minus one. When we're looking at standard enthalpy change of reaction, so looking at standard enthalpy change of reaction, you'll notice that it doesn't actually have a mention of one mole in that particular definition. The reason for this is a reaction can happen in multiple moles, in quantities of two or three or four moles, for example. It's not confined to necessarily one mole. So a standard enthalpy change is just the enthalpy change that takes place when a reaction, any random reaction, happens to occur. It's not defined as that reaction occurring in a certain molar quantity. So we're going to start from the beginning and look at what an enthalpy change actually is. And in doing so we can then introduce how we actually measure these uh, standard enthalpy changes that we've just spent a couple of minutes talking about. But let's uh, first try a few quick exercises just to test out your understanding of these particular definitions. If you've got them on flashcards already, fantastic, why not grab that and have it to hand. Or if you've got them on a piece of paper as part of your independent study, then grab hold of that as well. So this first one at the bottom, although this particular reaction is balanced properly, it's not a balancing problem we've got, why is this equation not representative of the standard enthalpy change of combustion for methane? So why not pause the clip and find the definition? And once you've found the definite definition, uh, see if you can think about why this particular equation doesn't apply to it. Hopefully you spotted that the water wasn't in the standard state, it should be a liquid, not a gas, and it has two moles of methane being combusted when it says in the definition that one mole of the substance needs to be combusted. Let's try one more. So with this one, why is it not the equation representing the standard enthalpy of formation of sulfur trioxide, SO3? Everything is in the right uh, physical state. Go and have a look at the definition I've got on the screen, see why this might, might not apply to it properly. So like before, two moles of substance are being formed, but in addition it's not being formed from its elements in their standard states. So you have to be very careful when you're looking at writing out an equation to represent standard enthalpy changes that you're obeying all the different parts of the definition. It's very easy to make these kind of mistakes in the heat of an exam, um, so it's a good, good idea to make sure you're practicing some of these um, before you find yourself in a test situation. So a chemical system uh, gives out or takes in energy during a reaction. So the system is the reacting chemicals and the products formed, and the surroundings are the rest of the universe. Now, that might be quite a big statement, 
So in other words, the surroundings can be uh, the container and then the air surrounding that container and then you standing there watching that container and then the room that you're in and then the building that room is in. I think you're probably working out where I'm going with this. So the surroundings just keep going and going and going and going. What's important is how do we measure how energy crosses the boundary between the system and its surroundings. Now looking at the graphic a bit more closely you can clearly see what exothermic and endothermic mean. Um, hopefully you've come across exothermic and endothermic from GCSE and you should have um, a pretty good idea of what the definition is of exothermic or what the idea is of endothermic. And the problem happens when we're trying to uh, measure the heat transfer during a chemical reaction. We use a thermometer in the lab and the difference between what we actually pick up on a thermometer and what's actually transferred is quite significant. So due to the heat loss idea we talked about um, a minute or so ago, um, we have to be aware of the issue of heat loss when we're taking into account um, the differences in enthalpy changes that we end up calculating and the enthalpy change that we're expecting to find. So the actual um, process of measuring an enthalpy change is called calorimetry. Now you see two pieces of equipment um, or two setups on the screen. Uh, they're both classified as a calorimeter because they help us measure the enthalpy change of a reaction. So both of these are attempting to measure the heat change during combustion, but one is definitely better at um, trying to control the heat loss uh, compared to the other. So if you look at the diagram on the left, which is quite similar to the kind of setup you'd use at A level um, in a laboratory, heat loss is, is in all directions, so any measured heat change will be far lower than the energy actually released. Now this isn't a problem at A level, so long as you're aware of it and can, and can explain why there's a difference between what you've actually measured and what you were expecting to find. That's actually okay, that's part of being a practical chemist. Things don't always go according to plan, um, least of all in chemistry. So let's have a quick chat about the one on the right. So although the piece of equipment on the right is more sophisticated, it's still not 100% perfect because you will never actually prevent heat loss. Now I've done a separate clip um, on, uh, on my YouTube channel that talks a little bit about why these two systems are different to each other. I just wanted to very quickly in this particular clip um, talk about the idea of different levels of sophistication calorimeters. Now in terms of the cost of the equipment on the left hand side, obviously you get what you pay for. Um, these are approximate figures, I'm not going to be held to them obviously, but in, in a general scheme of things these are the sort of costs you're looking at. So in terms of what you'd find um, in an, an average A-level laboratory or in a university laboratory, the equipment on the left is perfectly fine, so long as you're aware that there's some limitations in using it. Now, why is it so expensive on the right? Well, because the food industry uses this, amongst other um, industrial applications. Now, you probably won't be surprised to find out that the bomb calorimeter is actually used to measure calories. The sample in the cup that's labelled there is actually usually a sample of a piece of food, like pasta or peanuts or crisps or chocolate or something very yummy like that. And um, by burning it in an oxygen atmosphere, they maximise the amount of combustion that takes place. And uh, it's burned electrically using ignition wires to try and avoid heat loss to the air, so to speak. But it's still just a bog standard thermometer, you can see, just stuck in the top. A little electric stirrer keeps the heat moving around in the water. And the metal container uh, prevents the heat being lost to the surroundings. But it's not 100% perfect even though it's much more expensive. So looking at our humble laboratory calorimeter, this will enable you to measure the heat change for a specific sample of fuel, but is that fuel one mole of substance? So because in the diagram we're looking at ethanol, the MR of ethanol is 46.0 grams per mole. 
So one mole is going to be 46 grams. That's all fine so far. Let's put a, a theoretical uh, scenario down and see if we can work from there. So let's say you perform this experiment and you get that data. How would you go about working out the standard enthalpy change? Well, there's two steps you have to take. And the first one is actually to calculate the heat loss. So um, it's not quite as simple as just using the temperature uh, change that you get. You have to take into account the actual mass of the water that you're being heated. So the heat loss, or Q, is the energy transferred in joules, or J, capital J, as the unit. Now M stands for the mass of water heated in the calorimeter. So this is going to be in grams. So C is something you don't have to memorise. Uh, that's given to you on your data sheet, and it refers to the specific heat capacity of water, which is basically the energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of pure water by one Kelvin of temperature. And its value is 4.18 joules per gram to the minus one per Kelvin to the minus one. And finally, we've got the measured temperature change in Kelvin. So the difference between the measured starting temperature and the measured finishing temperature. Now it's also important to point out that obviously you'll be measuring your temperature change in degrees Celsius. That's exactly the same as a uh, temperature change in Kelvin. So one Kelvin increase is the same as one degree C increase, even though zero Kelvin is minus 273 degrees C. You don't have to apply that difference when working out the, um, the temperature change in Kelvin. So before we get stuck into working out the value of Q, we have to take account of the fact that we don't have the um, mass of the water necessarily. We might be given the volume of the water. So let's say we had 100 centimetres cubed of water that we added to that metal can in the diagram. If the density of water is 1 gram per centimetre to the minus 1, we can now say that 100 centimetres cubed of water has a mass of 100 grams. So now we can start putting in the numbers. So that gives us 9,405 joules. So that means the heat loss that we've managed to measure is 9,405. It might not necessarily be the actual amount of heat that was lost by the reaction, but it's the amount that we managed to pick up. So now what we've got to do is convert that into an enthalpy change. So enthalpy change is uh, in kilojoules per mole. So what we've got to do now to work out the enthalpy change of combustion is the heat loss in kilojoules over the moles burnt. Now we know what the heat loss is, but we don't know what the moles burnt is. We can work this out. So I'll be using the mass of ethanol that was burnt, which is the difference between the starting mass of the spirit burner and ethanol and the final mass of the spirit burner and ethanol. Obviously, as the ethanol burns, the mass of the spirit burner and ethanol will go down together. So that difference is the amount of ethanol, the mass of ethanol that's been burnt. So if we put the numbers in, we get 0 0.0565 moles of ethanol burnt. So the value we get is minus 166.46 kilojoules per mole as our enthalpy of combustion uh, for ethanol. And I'll put a little footnote at the bottom right of the screen reminding you that that will obviously not give you minus 166.46. If you put it into your calculator, it will just give you positive 166.46. If you look at the starting temperatures and the finishing temperature, you can see that the temperature rises. And because the temperature rises, it's exothermic, so therefore we have to give a negative enthalpy sign instead of a positive enthalpy sign, because the chemical system is losing energy. So the calculation can be summarised in three simple steps. Step one is to work out the heat loss in joules. We use Q equals mc delta T to do this. Step two is to work out the moles of substance that's reacted. So in this case, it would be the moles of ethanol that was burnt. And then finally, divide Q, converting it to kilojoules, 
by the moles reaction to get delta H in kilojoules per mole to the minus one. So it's a good idea to pause the clip now and try some practice examples of this before we continue on to the last part, where we'll look at some experimental considerations um, when we're measuring enthalpy changes. So the first consideration is obviously how could your experiment be improved? You can see an improved version of the experiment uh, on the right hand side of the screen. Second consideration is the actual reaction itself. Is it a combustion? Is it a neutralization? Is it something? Uh, is it two liquids reacting with each other? For example, is it a solid reacting with a liquid? There's different ways of actually measuring temperature changes. You can see clearly a coffee cup wouldn't support a combustion going on inside it because the cup itself would burn as well. But you could easily put two um, reacting liquids in there and uh, take some precautions, like can be seen on the screen to uh, minimise or try and reduce the heat loss. So the actual experimental setup is something to have a consideration of as well. So here's a few things to think about when we finish off. They will ask you in exams, particularly in the new specification, um, what might predict the effect on heat change or to predict the effect on um, uh, delta CH, for example, of uh, mistakes, experimental errors. So I've listed uh, a few, they're not exhaustive, there's obviously quite a few that could be considered. Why not pause the clip, have a think about them, and then come back and uh, we'll see if we're in agreement. So as you can see, these mistakes all have uh, an effect on the heat change that we calculate. I've focused on the heat change in all of them, but also on the spirit burner one, if the spirit burner is still let, lit after you've measured the final temperature, you're still burning fuel, but you're not actually weighing that fuel or measuring the mass of it. So the calculated moles of fuel burnt will also end up being too low. So if the heat change is not correct, or if the moles that you calculate is not correct, that will have a knock-on effect on the actual delta H value that you come up with at the end. So they will ask you about these two. Okay, so I know this is a, a longer, uh, quick review than I normally do, but there was quite a few things to try and cram in. So uh, well done for making it this far, and uh, thank you for listening, and until next time, see you soon.